Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now what I've got in front of me here are the British Empire breaches for the game Gloom Trench, which is available through Fickle Dice Games. I'm going to make sure that all of the links in the description below will point you to the right direction to pick these up. Now these are 3D prints that have come off of my Mars 3, but there are also physical versions available if you follow a couple of those links. And I love how these guys have come out, they're so much fun. So whether you're going to use them for Gloom Trench or any number of other games out there, all of the paints will be listed in the description below. Thank you very much to Fickle Dice for sending me along these STLs to print and for sponsoring this video. Let's get started. Now one of the significant differences between the Breaches and most of the other miniatures in the Gloom Trench range is that these guys do have very specific heads. Rather than having optional ones that you can slot in and change around, uh, there's gas mask hoses and what have you, and they have very distinctive uh, facial masks on them, so they are fixed straight to the miniature. What this means is they are actually one-piece models, which makes them pretty sturdy. I did drop this other fella, and uh, rather than a shield snapping, he just bounced. So that's, <laughs> that's a pretty good sign to me. Once you are finished with assembly and cleanup though, popping them on their bases, first thing to do is to prime them with a spray of Xandri Dust from Citadel. Now there are quite a few khaki sort of primers out there. I've always found Xandri Dust to be one of the most useful for painting British styled uniforms, even historical miniatures. It's got the faintest hint of warmth in that yellowy khaki colour, which works super well for pretty much everything we're going to put over the top of it. And if you do miss anywhere, once it's shaded, it's just going to be a dark brown recess. And for these guys, that will look the business. So, speaking of that uniform, we're going to start with Vallejo English Uniform. Don't worry too much if you hit pretty much everything else into the bargain. Uh, it's important because this is going to be the lowest layer for a lot of these, uh, these uniforms. Just jam it in there. I'm using quite a stiff old brush to really work it into the recesses. And this way, like I said from earlier, if we miss anything, it's at least going to be mostly the right colour. So you'll see getting up under there is going to be a little bit of a challenge in some areas, but uh, you're not going to see those on the table, so don't worry too much if you can't reach areas that you can't really see. Now once that's done and had a chance to dry, ordinarily on the Rifleman, for example, I would use a little bit of tanned flesh from the Army Painter to paint any exposed skin. Now these guys don't really have any, maybe a tiny wee bit in the back of the gloves, uh, I'm not going to bother getting out the skin tone just to paint those though. In this instance, I'm basically going to skip over that and paint it as a second layer of glove underneath. It won't matter too much. But if you do want to go that route, then I recommend follow along with the Rifleman video. A bit of tan flesh will do the job. We are going to move on to Morgast Bone, and I'm going to use this to paint in the webbing. Now this you could also use Dark Sand from Vallejo. It's a very similar colour. And this will likely take a couple of coats to get a nice solid finish. Now to get a solid colour of Morgast Bone will take you two coats. Um, I have actually come back and given a third to these larger pockets of the front here, just I wanted to make sure these pouches were nice and solid. This is where batch painting comes in handy, because if you're painting three to five guys, then by the time you finish the first coat on the fifth dude, the first guy is dry and you can come back and just carry straight on painting. Now these fellas are wearing quite a lot more chain than the riflemen are. So what I've got is Iron Hand Steel, and I'm going to paint in a few metallic details using this stuff. Take your time as you come near the uniform, but don't worry too much if you do splash a little. You know, tidy up is going to be nice and simple. And remember too that some of these guys might have chain visible through the gaps in their cloak. So just a little bit of metallic, dab that in there. Now, just the same as with the skin, the stocks on the shotguns these guys are carrying are actually barely noticeable. But I have some beige brown from Vallejo here, and I am going to sneak in there and try to paint those, because, eh, unlike the skin, these will stand out a little bit more if they aren't painted. I also remembered I should have painted in the Iron Hand Steel on those shotguns too, so whoops, fix that up. <laughs> What I have here is black grey, and this is another Vallejo colour. Corvus black is very similar. What I'm going to use this for is pretty much anything that is leather. 
as well as some of the gunmetal and these little filters on the hose on the mask here. The mask underneath I'm going to leave in that English uniform color because it would be a sort of a sack hood I'm imagining, so it won't matter if it's uh, the same sort of color there. Now when it comes to their capes, I'm going to paint them in the same way as I have the rifleman, which means using Death Guard Green. Now I quite like a flat brush. I'm using here, this is the small dry brush from the Army Painter. And you'll see just by flicking a few times across the top of these uh, ragged bits of detail, I can paint over them without getting any paint into the recesses there. For the most part, it's just flat painting, nice and simple. And I'm going to swap to a smaller brush to get in around the neck and shoulders. Uh, but because these guys have got what looks like a big one-piece cape, what I'm going to do is paint the back of their heads and so this is a big one-piece item, and leave those little bits of uniform representing the sackcloth underneath in English uniform. Now Death Guard Green will cover quite well, but on cloaks this size I do recommend coming back and giving it a second coat just to make sure that it's nice and solid. Bearing in mind something this large is going to be kind of the star of the show, so a little bit of extra work will help it really shine. We're going to move on now to Green Grey from Vallejo, which, I hate to say it, is a green with a nice, <laughs> with a little touch of grey to it. I'm going to use this to paint in the woolen gloves. Now, there isn't a correct colour for these. You might want to do them brown instead. Um, just really find something you like the look of. I like Green Grey, so that's what I'm going to use. Now, one of the last base coats we're going to apply is Retractive Green, or Refractive Green. Uh, it's labeled differently on some pots. It is Vallejo 890. What I'm going to do is use quite a large brush to apply this to the shields, and I'll move to a smaller one when I want to get in behind some of these areas of detail uh, without getting it everywhere. All of the green metal, we're going to paint with this now. So take your time. Try to be careful when you come near areas that you have already painted. Uh, but yeah. This will coat very well over Zandri dust, as you can see. You might see now, because there's so much green plate on these guys, the reason why I've painted in their face masks with that silver metal instead. I quite like finding a way to make a face still stand out, even if it's not skin. Uh, I like the idea of it being something that is battered into shape and worn like that. Now we're going to paint in just a handful of the leather straps. And for this, I'm going to use Mahogany Brown, which, as well as being a lovely warm red leather sort of color, is also fun to say. Mahogany. Now, if you're feeling a bit saucy, you can also get in there with a little bit of that metal color from earlier and paint in the buckles. Not strictly necessary, but it will look cool. Now, there is one final color that I want to add to this fella here, and I'm going to briefly talk about environmental storytelling because it comes up all the time in video games, but I think we sometimes forget about it with our miniatures. So this fella here has got a great big chunk of metal bolted onto his shield, repairing some damage. If we flick him around, you can see that the metal has been all punched back and bent in. Something really big has hit this. And it took me a little while to realize that where that metal was bolted on is actually directly over the vision slit on this other guy's shield. So uh, all I can assume is that the last fella to be carrying this shield did not have a good time. And it's little things like that which really pepper the gloom trench range. They're everywhere, and I love that attention to detail. So I'm going to use German Field Grey as the color to paint in this replacement, because I love the idea of these guys going out into no man's land and picking up a bit of German maybe a tank or any old thing uh, which belongs to the enemy, and now they've bolted it to this shield. And once you've finished with that, cruise around, do any little bits of tidy up that you need to, and we're ready to shade the miniature. And what I'm going to use, this is the old Agrax Earth shade, uh, but if you want the new stuff to flow in the same way, what you can do is add just a little bit of Lamy and Medium to the top of the bottle, shake it up really well, and it will behave in very much the same way. Uh, you can also use things like Strong Tone from the Army Painter, or the Umber Wash from the Vallejo Gain color range, that will give you a similar effect, 
this is just what I like to use. I'm gonna load up my brush and go nuts. We're gonna completely drench this dude, making sure to jam it into all of the recesses so we don't miss anything. And yeah, once all of this is completely covered, we'll find a place for him to dry, leave him for about 40 minutes and see what we get. Now, depending on how quickly you want to get finished models on the table, you could base this guy up and call him done. He's not looking too bad at all. A little bit shiny, I'd probably knock that back with a matte varnish, which we're going to use later anyhow, but he's cool. We can take it a little bit further though, and for the sake of example, I am going to do that now. What I have is some Nurgling Green, and I'm using the dry paint here. Uh, we are also going to use the layer version of this in a minute. You can skip this stage if you prefer to just use one instead of the other. What I'm going to do is, with one of my little makeup brushes, just lightly start flicking along the broader edges of the cape to get a little bit of volume and a slightly lighter green on the edges. I'm going to need to go back to my pot occasionally to refresh the brush. As you see, as we build up that color, just looks a little more visually interesting. So I'm going to go over this a couple of times, and then we'll turn to the layer version of Nurgling Green, and we're going to use this in two ways. First, with a nice fine brush, we're going to pick out just a few of the extreme folds in the cape to make those look a little sharper, and as well, we can flick them around and use this brush to get into some of the areas that would be very difficult to dry brush, just to brighten those up, make them look a little more interesting. So there, with a combination of dry brushing and a few quick line highlights, we have the capes. I'll flick them around to the front, and you can see even there we've got those little bits all done up. Some folks don't like the textured effect that you get from dry brushing, but I think it really suits woolen cloaks and uniforms in particular. Now, swapping to a smaller brush, I'm going to start using some Ushabti Bone to pick out a few highlights on the webbing. And it really just helps sell the shape of it. It doesn't have to be perfect lines here. Just little bits of this to accentuate some of the raised areas. When it comes time to highlight the uniform, what I've got here is actually a mix. This is roughly three parts English uniform to one part Morgast bone. And you'll see it goes on fairly bright, uh, but it will dry down quite a bit and look a lot more subtle. Um, you could also just use Telan sand from Citadel. It's fairly close to this. But all I'm going to do is sketch out some of the extreme edges in his uniform, any rips and what have you. Just add a little bit more volume to them. Now we can finally have some fun weathering these shields, and doing this is actually an awful lot like weathering a full-size armored vehicle. What I've got is a little bit of packing foam that I've torn up and just folded over a couple of times to give me a nice rough brush. I'm going to dip it into some German camo black brown, which is quite a mouthful. Uh, it's basically the same as Rhinox hide though, so again, easy, easy alternative. I'm going to dab it off on my little paper here until I've seen what I'm leaving behind, and then I'm going to use this to just dot in along the edges and get some rough and damaged effects chipping along the edges of the shield. So concentrating on areas where it's likely to be dinged up quite a bit, and you'll see I don't leave behind very much at all in a go. So I'm going to do this first of all on the shield, and ordinarily I would say it's possible to overdo it, on an armored vehicle, but I think on these guys, the grubbier and uh, more battered they look, the happier you're going to be. And once you've knocked those around a bit, what you can do is use the same color again, and we're going to do just a few little lines along the edges of the smaller plates, because trying to do these with uh, the foam, you're going to make quite a mess of the uniform you've done. Then grab yourself a pencil. Something nice and soft, what I've got here is a B. Uh, 2B will also work very well. What I'm going to do is just lightly buff along the edges of some of those chips. If you go back and forth over it a few times, basically the more you add, the shinier it's going to look. So you can be quite, uh, quite haphazard with this, even just bash it along the top of the uh, rivets there. 
and air. Yeah, shine up some of these chips. As well as being really fun to do, that's also super easy. The last thing I'm going to do to weather in these things is to get a little bit of red leather from Vallejo. Scrag Brown is quite similar to this. And I've watered this down until it is basically the same as a shade. What I'm going to do is just dab this into a few areas where I want rust to have collected. And uh, since we're painting for Gloom Trench, you can be pretty generous with this. Generally speaking, with this kind of application, I tend to suggest that too much water in your mix isn't a bad thing, because it will then dry quite subtly. Now, it is ordinarily a little bit easy to put too much of this on, but again, thinking of Gloom Trench, nah, come on, more. And now, suddenly, with that little bit of extra detail, these guys look, ugh, so much cooler. What I'm going to do is apply a layer of varnish. Now, I am using Varnish Plus from Instar, and then what I'm going to do is go ahead and pop a base on them, just like the fellas that are in the Rifleman video, so I'll link to that. Let's get a look at these fellas once they are all complete. And there at last, our Gloom Trench British Empire breaches are complete. And as always, they are a lot of fun. Barring just a couple of the highlights, putting down the base coats and getting that shade on is actually really easy. These are a lot of fun to do, and really quite quick. The snow effects, I think, adds a lot to the miniature. They suddenly look frosty and gloomy, for lack of a better term. So I love doing that little bit of extra work. So thank you again to the team at Fickle Dice for letting me have a play with these, and hopefully you found something interesting here. As always, thank you very much to Exit23 Games for the light and sound equipment, as well as all of the wonderful patrons who are keeping me ticking in paints and glue, including my producers Alan Nuttall, Kyrie Crawford, Rod, Jimmy, and Andrew. Your support means the world, folks. Any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comment box below. My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So thank you very much for your time, one and all, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.